Please welcome to the stage the Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, George Eustace. Well, thank you very much. And it's a, a real pleasure to be joining you today and also to be able to address your annual conference in person after 18 months of COVID restrictions and a pandemic that has caused huge challenges for countries uh, right around the world. It's also a pleasure uh, to follow uh, both Lord Deben uh, and Mark uh, Bridgen. Um, Lord Deben used to complain to me that when he was doing uh, this particular role, uh, the green NGOs used to say thank you but to him, which he found immensely uh, frustrating. And I know he's adopted the habit uh, himself now, but I, I think he's made some very powerful points and some important challenges. Now, we are embarking on a period of change in the way we support farming. We are going to be free to pursue our own independent policies for the first time in half a century. And I'd like to thank the CLA for all of the support and advice that they've offered over the last few years. For the first time in decades, we've been able to directly involve farmers in co-designing our future policies so that we have the best chance of getting it right. From the CLA to the NFU and the TFA, and indeed farmers who might not be members of any group at all. Now, my own family have farmed in Cornwall for six generations. Farming families are at the heart of rural communities across the land. Over the years, they've shown considerable resilience. They have deep roots in their local parishes. Not only are they a key building block of the rural economy, but they also provide the social capital that underpins rural communities. Whenever there is heavy snow or a flood, farmers are there to provide a helping hand. But successful and profitable agricultural production is also crucial to the continued success of our food manufacturing industry. The food industry has an important role to play in the government's levelling up agenda. There is a food manufacturer in every parliamentary constituency in the UK except Westminster. The food industry is bigger than the automotive and aerospace industries combined and it's more evenly dispersed across our country. These manufacturers provide employment opportunities in areas where there might otherwise be deprivation. They offer apprentices, apprenticeships and opportunities for the next generation. They invest in research and development and they give local areas a sense of pride and identity. Whether it's Cornish clotted cream or the Cornish pasty, Melton Mowbray pies, Stilton cheese and countless other recipes in every part of our country. None of our food manufacturers could succeed without the farmers who supplied them with high quality produce. Farmers and food manufacturers also have a vital role to play in delivering our food security. The pandemic has taught us that domestic food production matters. The late 20th century view that agriculture was a primary industry and that it was somehow inevitable that we would ultimately rely more on imported food was always wrong and must be reappraised. There was a point during the early stage of the pandemic where there were genuine concerns that the world might turn in on itself and put in place export bans. Now, although thankfully that episode did not come to pass, the risk of it focused minds in Whitehall. Of course, trade will always be an important component of food security too. Weather events mean there is always a risk of crop failure and you need to be able to move goods around. But those countries in the world that import all or most of their food tend to be characterised by higher prices and less consumer choice, and that is hardly a model to follow. More importantly, climate change is a new factor which changes the context considerably. One of the first effects to present itself is likely to be water scarcity, and more specifically, the availability of agricultural land with access to water. Some parts of the world where crops can be grown today may find it harder to grow crops in future. We also have a growing world population set to rise to 9 billion by the middle of this century. The temperate regions of the world will therefore need to produce food for markets both at home and abroad, and the market signal for, the, for them to do so is likely to be strong. Now, much has been said about the state of the UK's self-sufficiency in the context of reforming UK agricultural policy. 
but it is also often misunderstood. Firstly, our production to supply ratio remains high judged against historical levels. It was running at not much more than 30% in the late 19th century and little more than 40% before the Second World War. Now our country learnt from that mistake, so the ratio increased in the post-war years, peaking at 75% in the late 80s, as production subsidies and intervention schemes drove overproduction. Some of the change since the late 20th century has been down to changing consumer trends. Rice consumption in the UK has increased fivefold since the early 1970s, and since we can't grow rice, it is hardly surprising that this should contribute to an increase in some imports. But if you look at the foods that we can produce, then our production to supply ratio remains healthy at around 75%, and it's actually been relatively stable since the turn of the century. We must also question whether successful domestic production is linked to state intervention or subsidies as some contend. Some of the sectors where we have greatest self-sufficiency are often those that were not traditionally subsidised and still aren't. We are close to 100% self-sufficient in poultry, in eggs, carrots and swedes. Sectors like soft fruit have seen a trend towards greater self-sufficiency with an extended UK season displacing imports. Now for most of these successful sectors, Direct payments are a largely inconsequential part of their business model. There has also never been a direct correlation between the total area of land farmed and our gross agricultural output. In 2017, almost 60% of agricultural output came from just 8% of farmers, operating on just a third of land in England. Our pig, poultry and horticulture sectors account for just 4% of agricultural land use in England, but generate around 30% of agricultural output. In Scotland, the fresh produce sector uses just 1% of land, but accounts for 16% of agricultural output. Now, of course, there are other sectors that are just as important to our food supply that need more land and have traditionally been subsidised. But even here, the picture is less clear than some assume. We are 86% self-sufficient in beef, fully self-sufficient in liquid milk, and we produce more lamb than we consume. And I'm often asked whether sheep farmers could continue without those direct payments. However, we estimate that around 40% of sheep farmers don't get the BPS payment anyway. Their landlord retains the BPS payment and charges them a rent for a grazing licence on top. And I've met such farmers, often young entrepreneurial sheep farmers who bring fresh thinking to the sector and do so without any subsidy. And they often have very little sympathy for the current system that subsidises land ownership and often is a barrier to them getting access to more land. So success in farming also requires attention to detail. And that is why the correlation behind the size of a holding and their financial performance is also weaker than some assume. Analysis suggests that in virtually every sector of UK agriculture, the top 30% of producers measured by their gross margin can compete with the best anywhere in the world. And whilst scale has some relevance to the cereal sector, given the cost of capital required, in most other sectors, many of the businesses within that top 30% are smaller, family-run enterprises which have high levels of technical proficiency and who score well by paying attention to detail. So there is little correlation between successful food production and area-based subsidies. There is every reason to have confidence in our ability to compete internationally. There is every reason to believe in the future of the family farm and no reason why we can't produce the food we need while accommodating some land use change. And it is for all of these reasons that direct payments, subsidising land ownership or tenure, cannot be right for the longer term. It doesn't even support food production if that were the aim. In fact, those who advocated it 15 years ago were explicit in wanting support decoupled from food production. And some at that time envisaged that area payments 
would just be a transitional arrangement to be removed altogether by 2020. However, in the last 20 years, the appreciation of the scale of the challenge we face on issues like biodiversity loss and climate change has grown enormously. These new challenges mean that we must seize this opportunity to establish a dis different system of rewards and incentives in agriculture. And that is why this government has chosen not to remove the budget, but to repurpose it. Now, I mentioned earlier that I come from a farming family. Advice was passed down the generations. My great-grandfather, George Henry Eustace, had an outlook that was forged during those difficult interwar years. And it led him to embrace an ethos very much rooted in self-reliance. In fact, he used to say, when the man from the ministry tells you he's going to pay you to produce something, it's time to get out. Um, now that I am, I suppose, uh, the man from the ministry, uh, the scepticism of my forefathers does weigh on me. And I sometimes hear it said that I must tell farmers what they need to do. Since the war, farmers have been told to produce more through production subsidies, then told to produce less through quotas. They've been told to drain their land, then told to put their land in set aside, and then subjected to a whole regime of pernicious cross-compliance rules with automatic penalties imposed under the last iteration of the Common Agricultural Policy. And an important part of the approach we are trying to take now is to break that cycle, not to tell farmers what to do, but instead to support the choices that individual farm businesses make. So the future policy will not be about a single subsidy payment with lots of rules attached, which is then used as an instrument of top-down bureaucratic control. No, the new policy will be optional, but open to all. It will be modular. Farmers will be free to choose which elements work for them. In some landscapes and in some sectors, some businesses may decide to embrace it extensively. For others, the scheme may be a smaller part of their business model, but they may make space for nature on less productive parts of their holding. It is not the role of government to tell farmers what to do, but rather to offer market-based payments to willing participants in order to incentivize the uptake of schemes on the scale required to deliver the policy outcomes that the government has set itself. But while it is not for me to tell an individual farmer what to do, I accept that we need to be clear about the policy outcomes we seek. These are to halt the decline in species abundance by 2030, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, to plant up to 10,000 hectares of trees per year in England, to improve water quality, to create more space for nature in the farmed landscape, and to ensure that we have a vibrant, and profitable food and farming industry, which supports the government's levelling up agenda and helps to safeguard our food security. We also have a responsibility to ensure that we do not overcomplicate or over-engineer schemes. Now, we've already announced uh, initial plans for our farming investment fund, which will support farmers investing in new equipment or facilities to reduce their costs or add value to the food that they produce. And we all know that economists often talk of productivity in the abstract, but that is not always a very helpful uh, concept in an applied context. In the real world, what we're talking about is profitability. And the aim of these funds is to support farm enterprises in the pursuit of higher profit margins. Now, the conventional post-war view in farming has been that productivity essentially means increasing inputs to drive greater volumes of production from the same unit. But many farmers are starting to see that there is more than one way to increase your profits. Securing added value and a higher price for your produce or reducing your inputs and costs increases profit margins, reduces risk and increases the resilience of the enterprise. And this approach accords with the second piece of advice handed down the generations from my great-grandfather, which was that if you want to make money in farming, you need to keep the salesman on the other side of the gate. And today, 
many farm businesses are already in the process of reappraising their approach and moving towards more extensive and regenerative farming techniques. Earlier this year, I attended the annual Groundswell event, which showcases some of the techniques increasingly being developed by these, those pioneering regenerative agriculture. In some ways, they are not uh, new techniques, but simply a rediscovery of a lost art, fusing it with the best technology available to us today to create a different sort of template for agriculture. Paul Cherry, the organiser, runs a 2,500-acre arable farm with beef. He's been using a no-till system since 2010 and has adopted herbal lays and mob grazing techniques. He uses no fertilisers and veterinary interventions for his cattle are minimal. In Gloucestershire, Jake Freestone farms 1,600 hectares. He's also embraced a no-till approach and uses cover crops extensively to protect his soils. He's reduced his fertiliser use considerably, no longer uses insecticides or seed dressings, and is reducing use of fungicides. He's seen biodiversity increase dramatically. There are other arable farmers who are embracing integrated pest management with renewed vigour, with the development of new techniques, for instance, using companion crops to assist in pest and disease control. And some dairy farmers are starting to realise that rather than making ever higher inputs in the pursuit of ever more yield per cow, it might be better to target a reduction in inputs, accepting a forage-based production system, a lower yield per cow annually, but a longer life for the cow overall. Others, such as James Robinson in Cumbria, have placed great emphasis on hedgerows and trees. He has found that sensitive hedgerow management provides shelter for cattle, extends the grazing season, and also promotes nature's recovery on his farm. Many beef and sheep farmers are starting to focus on maximising value from a more extensive system of production. Examples include Jilly Creed, a beef farmer in the West Country, and Neil Hesseltine, a sheep farmer in the Yorkshire Dales. There is growing public interest in pasture-based production and the provenance of meat, which producers are harnessing to add value. Now, for some, it'll mean maximising food production from the most productive soils, but maybe in new ways, such as Polybell Farm, which covers 5,000 acres, straddling Nottingham, Lincolnshire and Yorkshire. And they have been developing a very new way of addressing their low-lying peatland to ensure both resilience and environmental benefits. And many of the country's leading producers of fresh produce on our grade one fen soils are starting to think creatively about how they can manage their most valuable asset in a more sustainable way. Now finally, there are vegetable growers who are reducing their herbicide use by turning to the use of mechanical hose in row crops, reducing their reliance on fungicides by breeding natural resistance, or using strip tilling. Riviera Produce, a major brassica grower in Cornwall, found that embracing strip tilling for row crops caused the earthworm population to treble in just three years. And by using fungicides more sparingly, the natural protective waxes on the leaves of crops developed better. If I might say so, Cornwall is famous for its inventive spirit. And Riviera Produce are also part of a project pioneering a new technology that captures and bottles methane gas from slurry stores on dairy farms and then uses it as a tractor fuel, replacing expensive diesel. And they already have a, a tractor operating on the farm fueled in this way. Now our policies will support and incentivize all of these farmers. Those who embrace, embrace these sorts of sustainable practices will not only see the agronomic advantages inherent in them and the reduction in their costs, but they will also qualify for payments and incentives for the benefits their approach delivers for nature and for the contribution this makes towards the government's policy objectives. And today we are publishing more detail on our new sustainable farming incentive for next year. It focuses on soil health because the health of our soils is critical to improving both biodiversity, water quality, and the production of a healthy crop. We will pay a more generous payment rate than previous EU schemes. There will be fewer rules and more trust we will never address the complex environmental challenges we have 
unless we can incentivize changes across most of the farmed landscape. And that is what we aim to do. We are intending to review and increase countryside stewardship payment rates from January next year. The number of farmers applying for countryside stewardship agreements has actually increased already by 40% this year as people start to focus on the future. And I would say this, that for those who want to start making decisions now and move ahead of time, look again at countryside stewardship because it offers a great stepping stone to the new schemes. And we will ensure that farmers who enter into countryside stewardship agreements next year can convert to our new schemes from 2024 onwards. And I'll be setting out uh, further details of the successor scheme, Local Nature Recovery, in the new year. Its focus is going to be on making space for nature in the farmed landscape. It will pay farmers for using less productive areas of their farm to create habitats and support biodiversity and water quality. And it will also support collaboration between groups of farmers. Our third scheme, landscape recovery, will pay land landowners who want to take a more radical and large scale approach to producing environmental outcomes through land use change. And the reality is that some land use change will be necessary to reach the targets we've set for tree planting and for peatland restoration, which Lord Deben mentioned. And I will also be setting out more detail on this third scheme, landscape recovery, in the new year. Now, of course, there are other factors that will affect farm profitability, including trade. And for the livestock sector, maximizing value can depend on carcass balance and on being able to get access to a higher price for some cuts in overseas markets. There are opportunities for British agriculture in many Asian markets, including Japan and India, opportunities for the dairy industry in, in Canada and the United States, and opportunities for the sheep sector in both the United States and the Middle East. We've been working with the AHDB on opening access to these markets. I think that the AHDB do some fantastic work uh, on market access for agriculture, and we want to support their good work further. And that is why the Prime Minister this week has announced 10 new agricultural trade attaches to work in these markets uh, to open access and further our objectives. So in conclusion, this is a period of change, and it is therefore understandable that there will be some apprehension. But I believe there's also a great opportunity ahead, a chance to have an industry which is more independent and financially resilient, where the petty bureaucratic rule book becomes a thing of the past, where a future generation of farmers feel the satisfaction of seeing nature return to their land, seeing the health of their soils improve and the farm profitability improve with it. If we can get this right, then a decade from now, there will be a new generation of farmers wanting to get involved, and the rest of the world will want to come here to see how it was done. Thank you.